WQXR, in cooperation with the Citizens Committee on Displaced Persons, presents in transcription, A Man with a Cause. A Man with a Cause, a true story about real people, with Aline McMahon and starring Henry Fonda. You are an American. You are standing in front of a large gilded eagle, emblem and seal of the United States Foreign Service, in the American consulate at Stuttgart, Germany. This is a crowded, busy office. Phones are ringing. Officials are at work. You have an appointment with the consul general. You ask yourself, will he do it or won't he? Then a secretary approaches, a pretty American girl. She's wearing a dark dress. She smiles. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. The consul general will see you now. Thank you. This way, please. You walk down a long, narrow marble corridor. The phones and the buzzing and the voices fade out behind you. At the end of the corridor, you see a large, heavy oak panel door. The entrance to the office of the man who will say yes or no. The secretary smiles again. This is Mr. Robinson's office. Go right in. Thank you very much. Not at all. You are inside the door now. You've seen Reed Robinson before, working this way, his body hunched over a desk, reading papers, studying reports, signing documents. He's extremely able, reserved, and strictly enforces State Department directives. Now he looks up and greets you warmly. Well, Bill Sutter, welcome. Hello, Reed. I uh, heard the news. Sorry, the university is going to lose you. I'm sorry to be leaving. Well, Unra had to come to an end in Germany sooner or later. You've done a fine job at Heidelberg, but I guess you'll be glad to get back to the States again. I do look forward to it. There's always one thing about leaving Europe, the joy of returning home and being with your own people again. Is that so? Yes, in many ways, but this time it's not all so much joy. Oh, why? What's happened? I'll come to the point, Reed. As you know, I got leave of absence from my employer, the American Express Company, to work for a year with UNRWA in Germany. Yes? Besides working in DP camps, my job as UNRWA Director of Displaced Students at Heidelberg has been one of the most interesting and challenging I've ever had in my life. Everyone agrees that there couldn't have been a better person for the job. Thanks, but what I'm driving at is this. 300 displaced students are now studying in Heidelberg. They come from 17 different nations that were overrun and occupied during the war. The military permitted us to give scholarships to these 300 students. But now that UNRWA is folding, they'll be left completely stranded. Yeah, it's too bad, Bill, but uh, you know we get our orders from Washington. There's nothing we can do about it. UNRWA's funds are exhausted. It's cruel and heartless to treat these young people that way. There's no other way open, is there? That's why I had to see you before I left. I have a plan. A plan? Uh, what is it? To bring these students to America. 300 students? Yes. How? Help them get passports first. Then have you grant them visas to enter the United States. Will you do it? Will you? there tense, staring at the Consul General. Then suddenly you hear a burst of words pouring out at you, diplomatically, of course. It can't be done. Washington wouldn't allow it. The immigration quotas are filled. Too many people are opposed to foreigners entering the country. There's a housing shortage in the state. They'll have no place to live. Besides, where would they get jobs? How would they support themselves? Even if we do grant them visas, how would they get to the state? They haven't any money. They couldn't pay for the passage. No, it's impossible. The whole idea is completely impractical. There it is. The Consul General has given you every argument, every reason why it can't be done. And yet you know in your heart that it must be done. You answer logically, reasonably, some of the questions that are raised. Others you don't have the answers to. At least not yet. But you think you've planted a seed. You don't know. Reed Robinson is busy, so you turn to leave his office. He pats you on the shoulder as he walks you to the door. At the doorway, you pause for a moment. You reach inside your coat pocket and take out a small photograph of a three-year-old, lovable, tousle-haired child. 
The consul general looks at the picture approvingly, then asks, Your son? No, Reed, he's nobody's son right now. Uh, who is he? No one knows. May I ask why you're showing me this picture? A short time ago, I found this boy lying in a deserted hospital bed. Nobody knew who he was or where he came from. He was mostly eyes, as you can see from his picture. Big, dark, sad eyes. I picked him up and took him with me to Heidelberg. He's been with me ever since. With the doctor's help the other day, I gave him a birthday. I... I filled out an immigration form for him. You may not grant any visas for my students right now, but when I leave Heidelberg, I... I hope you'll make it possible for me to take him with me. May I take another look at that picture, Bill? Here it is. I've given him my name, Reed, and I've had him confirmed in my religion, Protestant. He's a handsome boy. You've set your mind on taking him with you, haven't you, Bill? He's going back to the States with me, one way or other. I'm sure of that. I'd just like him to go back legally, that's all. Well, it may not be possible to get a visa for him until next year. The court is appealed. I'm leaving Heidelberg in two days. Now, don't do anything foolish, Bill. You may regret it later on. Don't worry, Reed, I won't. I'm merely taking this boy to the States with me, and I hope you'll help. And goodbye, Bill. And the best of luck to you. The return trip from Stuttgart to Heidelberg takes two and a half hours. It's a cold March day and the roads are gutted and frozen. The detours along the road are endless. But your open army truck with no top on it keeps bouncing along until you're back at the university. In your office, there's a log burning in the fireplace, and it helps to thaw out the coldness in your body. Hello, Bill. Have you at the office this afternoon? It is Ruth Prager who's come in. Ruth Prager, your assistant. A dynamic person with a wonderful understanding of people. She looks 32, but she tells everyone her real age, 49. One thing about Ruth, that she's ever disappointed about anything, she'll never let you know about it. Oh, good heavens, Bill. What in the world happened? You look foolish. I feel awful, Ruth. Everything is wrong. Everything seems so hopeless. I wish I had the answer. The answer to what? To why so many Americans are narrow-minded. Narrow-minded? Yes, Ruth, narrow-minded. Well, now, what's eating you, Bill? I just come from the consul's office of Stuttgart. I've heard him say that Americans fear the country will be overrun with foreigners. That if displaced persons are allowed to enter, they'll cause an excess labor market. Why, he practically admitted to me that Americans aren't willing to act like decent Christians towards these people who lived through five years of torture and misery in DP camps and concentration camps. Mm. Ruth, I refuse to believe it's the American spirit to kick a person when he's down. Well, I'm sure it's not, Bill, but these aren't normal times. Now, we must have patience. Why don't people realize what America stands to gain if we open our doors to displaced persons? They won't take jobs away. Instead, they'll help fill existing labor shortages in America. Here, look at our records in the file. I know, Bill, I know. Here, here, look. Silva Mardis, age 19, factory worker. Eval Rosari, 32, teacher. His wife, Yuta, landscaping and horticultural specialist. And all these others, household workers, clerks, construction workers, machinists, language specialists, research workers, farmers, nurses, and babysitters. We have shortages in every one of these jobs in America today. I'm counting on you. Huh? What'd you say? I'm counting on you. When you get back to the States in two or three days, I'm counting on you to take a trip to Washington. Talk to some senators and congressmen. How'd you know I was planning to do that? Were you? I certainly was. Good. <laughs> oh, that someone's at the door. Come in. Excuse me. Oh, it's all right, Irene. Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Sutherland. Thank I... Just finished answering all the questions on the questionnaire you gave me. You answered all the questions? All of them. A uh, hundred and three questions. That's fine, Irene. We'll put it in the file. Mr. Suttis, I know there are lots of other people on the waiting list before me. But if there's a chance, if you get to America and there's a chance that, that I can come to America, please, please don't forget me, will you? I won't, Irene. I promise. Oh, thank you, Mr. Sutton. Thank you. It's all right, Irene. I'm sorry to be crying. Go ahead and cry. We understand. Ruth 
says we understand. But do we? Do we really understand Irene Hart, 19 years old, graduate of three concentration camps with a diploma tattooed on her arm to prove it? A serial number branded into her skin by the Nazis. Irene's parents were killed in a gas chamber, and she barely escaped being killed herself. When the American Army of Occupation freed her, she was one of 5,000 students who tried to enter the University of Heidelberg. She was lucky. She won her scholarship, she and 299 others. And now, now all the help we've given her is over. UNRWA's funds are exhausted. She will be left stranded here, stranded with 299 other displaced students, all of whom want to come to America, and none of whom America wants. <laughs> I suppose that's how you decide to become a man with a cause. How you decide to do something. To do something to really help these people. You are listening to the story of A Man with a Cause. With Aline McMahon as Ruth and starring Henry Fonda in the role of Bill Suttoth. The names of all characters and places are real, and all the incidents are based on actual happenings. We continue now with Henry Fonda as Bill Suttoth in A Man with a Cause. It is two days later. Your bags are packed and you are ready to fly back to America. The mail arrives in the morning, but there is no communication from Stuttgart. No envelope with a wing spread eagle on it. No visa for the three-year-old boy whom you found in a deserted hospital, whom you adopted and whom you've grown to love as much as your own son. Come on, Peter. Oh, here's Bill. He's in there waiting for you. Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill. Peter, something unusual will happen today. You bet something unusual is happening today. Peter, you're going to fly with me to America. America. That's right, Peter, America. Seriously, Bill, have you thought of how to get him on that plane? I thought of punching a few holes in a suitcase, putting him in it and carrying him aboard, but that's no good. Of course not. The customs men would inspect the suitcase. The only other way I can think of is to wrap him up in my raincoat, carry him under my arm. People are allowed to carry their own coats aboard. Say, hey, that might work. If I could only get him into the States, I'm sure they'd let him stay. They wouldn't dare send him back. If they did, I'd go to Congress. I'd do something to make them pass a bill or something. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. We need to get something done in America for these displaced persons. I'm a southerner, Ruth. Starkville, Mississippi's my hometown. They say it takes a little while for southerners to get started, but once we start... You don't stop until you get your way. I know. And I know you. Oh, good heavens, you better get started for your plane. Yes, please. Goodbye, Ruth. Goodbye, Bill. Bye-bye. I, I can't say all the things I want to say to you. You've been a wonderful person to work with and and a real inspiration to me. Without you, I... Don't say any more, Bill. I understand. I'll write you every day if necessary. Good. And don't forget about Washington. I won't. Believe me, I won't. Come on, Peter. We're off for America. But not yet. Something happens that you didn't expect. Outside, on the steps of the university... And on the campus beyond, 300 pairs of eyes look up at you. The eyes of 300 students who stand there in complete silence. You gulp hard. The impact and the meaning of your departure hits you like a sledgehammer. You recognize all these students. You know their names, everything about them. Where they come from, the stories of their suffering the plight of their wanderings through the rubble and waste and wreckage of war. You know more than that. You know the pain of their despair and the anguish of their insecurity. You know the hopelessness they feel and their yearning for a life of peace and usefulness. You know all this. And you stand there speechless. You glance down at tiny Peter at your side and suddenly he becomes a symbol. A symbol of the life and the people you're leaving behind. There are no words spoken. There's no movement. No stirring on the campus. There's only a warm breeze from the east, and the sun stands high in the west. You walk toward the jeep. You climb in. You, Peter. Your bag. 
and your raincoat. Your jeep starts moving, you wave your hand, and you're gone. official here, aren't you? That's right. Well, my papers are in order. My passport's been stamped. My bags have been cleared. What are you carrying inside that coat of yours? Now, look here. You don't have to... You'd better come along with me. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Please, I can explain... You shouldn't have done this, Mr. Sutter. You know it's against the law. All right. I've got a little boy in this raincoat. Here. Here he is. Take a look at him. One of my men saw you behind that wall. Listen to me, please. I found this child a year ago in a deserted hospital. When I first saw him, he was undernourished. His bones were thin. His joints stuck out like knobs. He couldn't walk. He was too weak from hunger. He had no one to care for him. He had no parents, no relations. No one knew who he was or where he came from. I couldn't leave him there all alone, so I picked him up and took him with me. My job at Heidelberg is over now. I'm headed back to the States. I don't want to leave this boy alone over here. If I take him with me, I can give him a chance to grow up decently like my own children. He needs a passport. That may be, but more than that, he needs decent food and love and care and a chance to live the same as every other child. Don't cry, Peter. I... Can't let you take him aboard that plane. Please, you must understand. He means a great deal to me. Let me take him aboard the plane. He'll be no extra weight on the plane. He's only 30 pounds or so. Throw my baggage away. Let me take him instead of my baggage. You can't go through the gate without a passport. I, I tried to get one for him, but the quota's filled. I can't take a chance. I'll lose my job if anyone finds out. Bill! Bill! Ruth! Oh, Mr. Gibson! Mr. Gibson came a few minutes after you left. The passport, the passport for cleaners. You hear that? You hear that, officer? A passport for Peter. From Reed Robinson, from Washington, from the people of the United States. It's the first one. Come on, Peter. We're headed for a land that's going to give you a chance to live, a chance that you never had before. Your thoughts are of your students in the East. 
You remember their names and how they told you their story. My name is Silver Margit. I am 19 years old. I am an Estonian. The Germans invaded my country in 1944. And when they came to my town, they, they, they picked me off the street. They forced me into a truck and drove me to the harbor. And they shipped me to southern Germany to work for them 16 hours a day in an airplane factory. I lived in a, in a horrible slave labor camp, 35 people in one small room. Resistance meant a, a concentration camp or a bullet. I have no future in Europe anymore. Will America give me a chance? I know I can make a good American citizen if I were only given a chance. Will you help me, Mr. Feather? Stepan Tobaskis is my name. I'm 37, and I'm a Lithuanian. I used to write books for children, and later I worked for the Red Cross. I, my wife, and my child were sent by the Germans to Schwarzwald near Baden-Baden. We were forced to work as slave laborers in a small parts factory. The factory and the railroads in the whole town were bombed by the Americans. And all of us were glad. Mr. Sutter, we would like to go to America. I could work in a factory or on a farm or any place to support my family. Could you help us? Please. Irene Huss, and I'm 20 years old. I am Polish, and I fought against the Germans. I was in the resistance movement from the beginning. I was captured twice, but I escaped only once. The second time, they put my father, my mother, and me into a concentration camp. They murdered my father and mother in a gas chamber. They almost murdered me. I want to study bacteriology and be a chemist in America. I can speak English, I can type, and I can translate many foreign languages. You are an American, and you are flying back home after spending a year with displaced students at Heidelberg. You know the stories of 300 of them, and they are only a handful compared to the million displaced persons who are living in Europe, all of whom seek a new life in a new land. You think of America and what it can do when it makes up its mind. You think how Americans can manufacture a million planes, build 100,000 ships, and transport and supply 12 million soldiers on five continents in time of war, an overpowering task. You think of UNRWA, America's great humanitarian effort, which sent millions of tons of food and thousands of carloads of clothing to war-torn areas in time of peace. You think of all these tremendous accomplishments, and you're sick, because America has not yet faced up to the simple problem of helping those people who have the greatest need to be helped, displaced persons. You have studied the facts. You know the figures. Displaced persons represent almost all religions. Some 80% are Christians of various denominations. 20% are Jews. More than half of the displaced persons are women and children. There are 150,000 children below the age of 17. Of these, 70,000 are under six years of age, like Peter. We could do something to help these people. We could do something right now. In our Congress, there are two bills up for passage. These bills would admit only 100,000 to 200,000 displaced persons, instead of the 400,000 that we're able to care for at the present time. But we must deal with reality. We must have immediate action. We must offer a haven and refuge for these people right now. Would you like to know what I did a few days after my plane landed in the United States? I flew to Washington and I saw my congressmen and senators. I wrote to other congressmen and to other senators. I told them what I saw, what I knew, what I felt. They listened and they promised support. You can do the same thing. You can write your congressmen and senators. A simple letter explaining in your own words what you think, what you feel, what you want done about admitting displaced persons to America. Later, perhaps, we can amend the law to bring in 400,000 displaced persons. But right now, let's really make an effort to relieve the suffering that's going on in Europe. Let's open up our hearts and be generous and considerate. 
Let's show the rest of the world that America is on the side of humanity, not only in thought, but in action. My fellow countrymen, will you join me in writing to your congressman? Will you? Please, it's very important. Oh, by the way, besides Peter, who came back to America with me, I've worked pretty hard, and I've been lucky enough to get 55 of my 300 students into America. Everyone who's met them says, no question about it, they'll make fine Americans. Now my goal is to get the rest of them in, and then 400,000 more. You have been listening to A Man with a Cause, written and directed by Mitchell Grayson and produced by Ted Hudis, with Aline McMahon as Ruth and starring Henry Fonda as Bill Suttoth. Featured players in our cast were Augusta Dabney, Teresa Keene, Sarah Fussell, Ed Jerome, and Joe DeSantis. Original music composed and conducted by Isidore Zier. Legislation for the admission of a fair share of displaced persons is endorsed by many national labor, civic, educational, and religious organizations, including American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, American Legion, Catholic War Veterans, Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America, National Catholic Welfare Conference, the major national Jewish organizations, National Conference of Union Labor Legionnaires, United Council of American Veteran Organizations, and hundreds of others. This program was presented under the auspices of the Citizens Committee on Displaced Persons, whose board of directors include Major General William J. Donovan, James A. Farley, Miss Virginia Gildersleeve, William Green, Herbert H. Lehman, Philip Murray, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Edward R. Statinius, Charles P. Taft, Barry Bingham, and Earl G. Harrison, Chairman. <laughs>